so welcome everyone uh, once again so for those that don't know me my name is uh, Dominique Martin I'm a professor of ethics uh, of AI ethics and business ethics at the School of Management Sciences at the Université du Québec uh, à Montréal so I want to welcome everyone I want to welcome uh, Susan Schneider but also our two uh, discussants so Karina Vold and Jonathan Simon that I will introduce as we properly as we as we uh, move on. So this is our last uh, conference this year. So I also want to thank uh, everyone for their continued participation. We had really big audiences this year for all of our talk, a lot of uh, discussion. So this is, uh, this is great. It confirms, I think, uh, Martin Gibert and I uh, believe that uh, there was like an interest and even a need, I think, for this uh, sort of discussion, deeper, longer discussion on some specific issues in, uh, in AI ethics. Uh, so since it's our last talk of the year this year, I also want to uh, maybe take a minute to uh, thanks our uh, sponsors and, and partners for the series. So uh, first, Ernst Young and Anne-Marie Hubert, who has been very involved in the series since, uh, since the beginning. The Mila, I saw Yeshua Benjo a, uh, a bit earlier, just a quick image that disappeared. Um, Ivado, uh, la uh, so chaire de recherche du Canada en analyse. Hello, Yeshua. Nice to see you. So la chaire de recherche du Canada en analyse respectueuse de la vie privée et éthique des données uh, massives. And Sébastien Gamps, who has also been a partner of the, well, involved in the series. Hi, Sébastien. Um, the Avia, obviously, uh, no pun intended, uh, that is a partner and will take care of the, the logistic and the, 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 the Zoom aspect of the meeting, uh, the Humania group at uh, UCAM, and uh, finally, old Marie Marcou, who has been uh, involved with us, has been helping us with the series since the, the beginning. Um, so you may see there's uh, someone in the meeting called Zoom Avia. So this is Christian from uh, the Avia, in fact, who is dealing with communications uh, there. So it's our last time of the last talk of the series. Uh, we will uh, soon, I think, have uh, one of my favorite time of the year. So the meeting when we start planning who we will invite for next year. But in the meantime, so if you've missed some of the conferences that we had, almost all of them are available on our website. They have been recorded so you can access them. I think the only one that is missing is uh, Lee Nguyen Ong, um, but that should be online soon uh, as well. Which uh, bring me to the point that so we are recording the, the meeting today. We're not exactly sure what we're going to do with it at this point yet. Uh, but if uh, so, well, first, I encourage everyone to keep their video feed on. It's much more uh, human and lively, I think, if we can see people's faces. And after a year and almost a year and a half of this uh, distanciation, it's just really great to, to see people's faces. With that said, if you don't want your, your, um, your beautiful faces to appear in the recording, you can simply turn your, your camera off. But again, I invite everyone to just keep their camera open because I think it's just more, um, it's just more fun uh, that way. Okay, so the plan for today is to have our main talk with uh, Susan Schneider. She will speak for maybe 35 uh, minutes more or less, more or less, sorry. Uh, then we will have two uh, comments uh, from our, uh, one comments from each discussant. I will offer Susan a chance to reply to these comments, and then we will open uh, our virtual floor to questions from the public. So for the question, I'll say that when we get there, but you can either just uh, raise your hand or, no, sorry, write your name in the chat, and then I will give you an opportunity to ask a question yourself, or you can write a question in the chat. And in that case, I will ask the question uh, for you. Um, so I think this is it pretty much. Euh, Laissez-moi peut-être juste dire quelques mots en français. Donc, bonjour euh, tout le monde. Je ne vais pas tout répéter, euh, mais je tiens à dire simplement que je suis très heureux que vous, que vous soyez euh, ici pour cet événement qui est notre dernier là, de la série euh, cette année. On commence bientôt, on va commencer à planifier là, les conférences pour euh, l'année prochaine. Euh, en attendant, s'il si, euh, y a des conférences euh, auxquelles vous n'avez pas pu assister, euh, les enregistrements vidéo se retrouvent sur notre site web, là, sauf la dernière conférence de Lee Nguyen Hong. Et je vais simplement euh, rajouter qu'on essaie quand même que l'événement soit bilingue là, ou euh, facilement accessible là, euh, en français et en anglais là, pour un maximum de personnes. Donc, n'hésitez pas, là, si pendant la période de questions, vous voulez poser une question euh, en français ou il y a un point de clarification, euh, vous pouvez simplement le, le mentionner et on fera. Donc, je m'occuperai de faire la traduction simultanée là, euh, 
si jamais il y a des enjeux là, à ce niveau-là. OK, so, um, without further ado, let me first introduce Susan Schneider, who has many titles and affiliation, in fact, but so primarily, I think you, 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 uh, you are the, the director and one of the co-founders of the Center for the Future uh, Mind at the Florida Atlantic University, FAU. Uh, and you're also the William Dietrich Distinguished Professor there in philosophy, I presume, um, uh, at, the, at the Florida Atlantic University. Uh, you are also the NASA Baruch Bloomberg Chair at the Library of Congress and NASA, uh, but also Distinguished Scholar Chair at the, at the Klan Center of the Library on Congress. I think you, you completed that. You can correct me if I'm wrong uh, later on, but that you completed a two-year project with NASA on the future of intelligence, which seems completely fascinating, actually, for all sorts of reasons. Um, so your, your main work uh, touches uh, on many, I think, deep and important topics, such as the nature of the self, the mind and consciousness. You address these questions from different disciplinary perspectives, so some from the perspective of philosophy, from AI studies or research more specifically, from the cognitive sciences, and even from, in fact, astrobiology, which I take, I'm, I'm not an expert in that field uh, at all, but I take that to be um, a field that studies the origins or evolution of life in the universe. So basically questions about the existence of extraterrestrial life. Oh, my apologies for that. Um, I, I even aliens. think you, you get, sorry? I'm an expert on aliens. Exactly, expert on aliens. That's much simpler. <laughs> uh, you even gave a talk on, on uh, I think, on the, 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 the what uh, these, that type of life would look like if it visited us here on Earth. Uh, so anyway, very interesting. You uh, have published a few books. So your last book, Artificial You, AI and the Future of Mind, which was, which was published at the Princeton University Press in 2019, which is... The, I think your talk will gravitate a lot around the arguments that you make uh, in that book, even if you present maybe a slightly uh, new perspective on some of these ideas. Then you published another book in 2011 uh, entitled The Language of Thought, A New Philosophical Direction. And you edited the two books, Science Fiction and Philosophy at, uh, with Willie Blackwell and The Blackwell Companion to Consci Consciousness with Max uh, Vellman's Uh, so maybe I can just say uh, to, to, uh, to finish this long introduction, because there is a lot to say that you're also quite engaged, engaged I'm sorry, in public debate and scientific communication. Uh, so you, you gave a lot of interviews on television shows, um, wrote op-eds for, for newspapers. And I think we see it in the type of work that you produce also that is very accessible, which is a really, I think, a great strength of, of, of that type of work. So today, you're going to present a talk entitled, Is Consciousness a Correlate of Highly Sophisticated Intelligence? Question mark. Um, and so where you sort of try to see whether consciousness is an unavoidable, unavoidable byproduct of sophisticated uh, intelligence, and you will consider some uh, other ethical and social implication of that, of that question. So thank you very much, Susan, for being here. And, and go ahead whenever you're ready. Do you have slides? We'll make sure, I think you have slides. Yeah, I'll share my slides. Thanks, thanks okay. for the kind introduction. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't think aliens are going to visit anytime soon. I think they oh, would be from too us, bad. Actually, if they even exist, too bad. they should run too bad. really, really far, far away. Um, but let me um, share my slides. And Dominic, I have to apologize because I, I changed the title of the talk. I will touch on some of those issues, but this is a totally, as I mentioned to a few of you earlier, this is a totally new talk. I, in fact, wrote it last night. All right. So, so we're really the first audience to get access to these actually, ideas. I started it. So that's even years. better. Yeah. Sorry? Yes, but I have to apologize because it will be uh, embarrassingly provisional. Um, okay. So let me go ahead, though, and get started. Um, all right. So... Um, I, this is going to be really contentious, too. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about the global brain. Okay, um, so I'm going to give an argument. It's very skeletal. 
Um, but it draws from scenarios about the future of AI that are currently envisioned by many, such as widespread technological unemployment over the next, say, 30 years or so, powerful multinational tech companies with advanced cloud-based AI at their disposal, the widespread use of wearable technologies, that is, um, clothing, wristbands, and whatnot designed to track our data, as well as the possible use uh, within 30 years of brain chips, uh, brain machine interfaces more generally. That said, the argument says the following. If some of these scenarios obtain, we may be faced with a future in which we humans are part of a global brain network. Okay, so to give you a sense of what I'm getting at, um, so I'm writing a new book for Norton um, called From Bio to Bit, Our Place in a Universe of Intelligent Systems. And this is intended to be part of that book. So um, I was sort of writing a little provisional paragraph the other night, I'll read it to you. Here is an idea I find horrible, yet hard to resist. We are already part of a computronium, the internet, a massive network utilizing matter and energy throughout the globe for, for its computations. We are the sensory transducers delivering scores of information into machine learning systems. In particular, the data itself shapes the algorithms. And today's algorithms are but a unified hodgepodge, a disunified, excuse me, hodgepodge of unintegrated programs. But over time, the disunified labyrinth of code may integrate in order to facilitate faster, more higher bandwidth information transfer and communication between devices on the internet of things. Perhaps a single highly integrated system may emerge and be super intelligent, outperforming humans in every intellectual respect. The internet computronium, as I call it, is created by us and it depends on us. Its shape is determined by market forces and internet regulations, regulations that may foster human flourishing or fail humans entirely leaving us in a cyberpunk dystopia like the Borg in Star Trek. <laughs> okay, so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. I, I think I was drinking when I wrote this. I get really pessimistic when I write. Um, okay, so I'll be talking then about what I call the global brain argument. And here's the argument, and I'm sure it has lots of things that uh, need to be added. Okay, premise one is what I call a hyper-intelligence premise. It says that AI continues to get smarter until eventually there are, quote, hyper-intelligent AIs. That is, AIs that are either what I call savant systems, which I'll explain shortly, or the more well-known category of super-intelligent systems. Premise two is what I call the global brain thesis. And it says that one or more savant or super intelligent systems will have an extensive cloud presence, including or cooperating with leading apps and search engines, such as, for instance, something like a Google global brain. Premise three is what I call the nodes premise. It says that people become nodes in this system, wiring into the cloud super intelligence or savant intelligence. Either they wire in by actually having brain chips that connect them, as in the Neuralink scenario, I call this being Neuralinked, or they have wearables or smart bodies that wire them in as nodes. Premise four, if these scenarios all obtain, these wired in humans will become part of a global brain. Premise five asserts that 
the situation obtains. And the conclusion says that wired in humans become part of a global brain. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna walk through the controversial premises of the argument and clarify things a bit. Premise one, okay, so I'm always, when I walk through it, I'm gonna just restate the premise at the top. So I'll let you read that again. I suspect everybody here is familiar with the idea of superintelligence. A superintelligent system, remember, is a system, hypothetical, obviously, that outsmarts humans in every way possible. Social skills, mathematical reasoning, et cetera. Every way possible. Now, I'm not going to rehash the usual case for the emergence of superintelligence. I discuss it briefly in my book. Um, the book I really like on this topic is actually Nick Bostrom's book. Um, I, you know, I agree with his case that we will have superintelligence, although you know, I'm not so sure it needs to emerge from anything that is recognizable AGI. Um, it I suppose it depends on what you think AGI is. I don't really like the expression, but some people tend to think AGI means a system that's functionally indistinguishable from a human. Um, I, I don't even like thinking of that as a marker that needs to be achieved before superintelligence. But in any case, I'm not going to rehash you know, the argument for the presence of superintelligence, um, you know, it's in my book too, in br a briefer form. Um, but what I want to stress is that the premise only requires the presence of a weaker form of AI, which I call a savant system. So the premise kicks in sooner. Let me explain what I mean by that. Um, I recently talked about it in an interview um, with Scientific American. Um, so I suspect that the first few generations of synthetic general intelligences will be deficient in ways that normal adult humans are not. And by a general intelligence, I mean anything that has flexible domain general reasoning, such as my dog even. Um, I don't mean an AGI. Okay, so I suspect that, actually I suspect to be honest that Technically, GPT-3 may qualify as a general intelligence, but I won't get sidetracked on that. But I suspect that as things progress, we'll see very intelligent systems that don't technically meet Bostrom's definition of superintelligence, but they're extremely impressive. They'll be what I call savant systems, surpassing us in certain ways that involve sophisticated memory databases, pattern recognition, mathematical processing, and so on. I'll call these savant systems because they have terrible deficits, however, relative to us. So uh, I'm actually probably more optimistic than some about causal reasoning, but I am worried about moral reasoning. Um, you know, think about the moral deficits that a sociopath has. Um, I wouldn't call a sociopath system, a super intelligent system, but a savant system could have a key deficit in its moral reasoning. Um, and I think those kinds of systems, the savant systems will inevitably come first, way before super intelligence. Um, this does have a little implication concerning AI safety, which is not directly relevant to the talk, but which I do want to call your attention to just because I think for moral reasons, we should think about AI safety. Savant systems are potentially far more dangerous than super intelligence because of these deficits. Think of Jeffrey Dahmer, <laughs> right? Um, and they will exist first. I'm not saying the systems will be sociopaths, but they will be systems that are far more intelligent than us in some ways, yet idiotic in others or morally perhaps um, bankrupt or, you know, not, not able to rise to the challenge of superintelligence. Okay, so that said, now I want to go to the next premise. So the global brain thesis said, says that 
one or more of these hyper-intelligent systems, that is systems that are either savant systems or super intelligent systems, will have an extensive cloud presence. And further, it would include, or at least cooperate with leading apps and search engines, okay? So this could be Google. Now, to me, this actually sounds like a, a future <laughs> in, in, in which Google just succeeds at what it's doing. But sadly, it also seems like a future in which the Chinese government continues um, supremacy at AI and decides that it wants to oppress a minority or two and could continue to control its population. It's also a situation in which the US Defense Department just overreaches and cooperates with the tech giant to accomplish this. So there are lots of possible routes to a global brain. So by global brain, then, I have in mind what we might call an AI superpower system. There could be several AI superpowers. There could be a superpower arms race. In fact, I think there's already an AI arms race. So again, I don't think this is all that insane. Um, furthermore, you could unwittingly be a node in each of the superpower networks. And I'll talk about what it is to be a node shortly. More generally, the ingredients for the global brain scenario are market forces pushing for smarter and faster AIs, including ever more expansive and refined search engines, facial recognition systems, personal assistance, autonomous vehicles, which work in more situations than work for us as cognizers, so better and better AVs, and so on. An increasingly efficient an integrated internet of things in homes and businesses and you know, smart cities, a more and more unified group of track sensors that track biological weapons, pandemic risks, environmental hazards, cybersecurity risks, and that are utilized in world state sensor programs. I, I think DARPA has been working on this kind of project. I recently was at a whole meeting on this at the Beyond Center at Arizona State. I think this is very much the wave of the future, especially in light of um, reasonable worries about biological weapons and pandemics. Further, situations would be one or more global tech giants that own the engines and have great political power. So tech monopolies that aren't broken up, for example. Computational speed increasing. I won't say Moore's law because I don't want to spend the whole talk fighting about Moore's law. Okay, but you get the idea. All right, so there's an older global brain hypothesis out there. Um, mine is different. Um, so this one dates back to 1983. Um, and it tends to be very utopian, for one thing, um, because they simply didn't anticipate the ills of cybersecurity and the social media and Bostrom's control problem, for instance. Um, it says that the internet will increasingly link its users into a single information processing system that functions like a collective self-aware system, a nervous system at a planetary level. Now, just to dissociate myself from this view, I want to say a few things. First, I'm not committed to the idea that the entire in internet will be something like a hyperintelligence. I'm not committed to the idea that it would have feelings, consciousness, or self-awareness, except if you mean self-awareness in a really basic way, i.e. the system needs to know its system boundaries, otherwise it'll be hacked because information will be able to enter the system that's not part of the system. But I don't think it needs anything like a sophisticated sense of self or a felt quality to experience to be intelligent, and indeed to be hyper intelligent. Further, I'm not totally on board with an exact analogy with the nervous system, but it's worth pointing out that the older um, global brain history proponents 
hypothesis proponents, sorry, uh, pointed out that web browser, browser search engine, al excuse me, search algorithms are like a sort of basic prefrontal cortex in ordering priorities. And something like Facebook's like button functions as a kind of primitive amygdala, if you will. Further, web pages play a role similar to neurons and are connected by hyperlinks, um, you know, which are said to be like synaptic connections and form a sort of associative network. Now that's extraordinarily basic. I'm not pushing that analogy too far, but this is the older line of thinking. I do think it would be interesting to look at this from a more mathematical perspective. In particular, I'd be interested in looking at um, you know, the work on hubs by people like Olaf Sporns in the connectomics literature, where they talk about certain networks of information um, motion throughout the brain, in particular, there are hubs, um, you know, and this gets into network theory and looking at if information flow on either the web or the internet follows that kind of format. I think there's an interesting question here, or there are lots of them actually. Um, one thing that I would ask, and I cannot answer now, of course, is that at what point would an incipient intelligent cloud-based system such as Google actually constitute a hyper-intelligent system. It would be interesting to devise metrics. Um, it connects up with some work I did with NASA um, on um, alien techno signatures um, out in space. A, a, a famous example, of course, is from my friend Freeman Dyson, the, the Dyson sphere, right? Um, in fact, Freeman and I were working on alien techno signatures, but he's sadly deceased recently. Um, so we might also consider using a measure of information integration to see if, you know, there's any information integration in these systems. But of course, that gets into measures for phi and a bit of a aside there, you know, issues about computational tractability and what, what phi measures, but I'm not claiming we want to measure it for consciousness, just that we might use some sort of an information integration measure to see how cohesive and integrated and intelligent a system is. I think the defensive, the US Defense Department case, the, the fact that they're interested in this illustrates that the presence of a hyperintelligence may not be apparent to us. So we might, even if we have the right means of detecting it or testing for it, we may not even be able to access the system. Okay, now those are all my comments or refinements on the global brain hypothesis, the older version. Other features of the global brain hypothesis that were developed back around the time of the 1980s included number two, the claim that intelligence is distributed, collective, fine. Um, and three, the system is usually said to have self-organizing emergent behaviors. And I think it's interesting now to think about this, this in terms of Nick Bostrom's recursive self-improvement algorithms and the move to superintelligence. Okay, all that being said, you get the idea now, you know, there is this older view, but it was kind of, I don't know, to put it bluntly, a little flaky. Um, and kind of new agey. Um, and it focused a lot on the neuromorphic aspect of the global brain, which I'm not really prepared to push. Now let's turn to the nodes premise. So that's premise three. This one's interesting from a metaphysical standpoint. Um, so the nodes premise says that people wire into the cloud hyperintelligence. Either they are neuralinked, that is there's brain chips connecting them, or they have wearables or what you might call smart bodies or both. Now, what's a node? I'm just gonna state that what I mean by that is what metaphysicians call a concrete particular, you know, not an abstract mathematical equation or process. So a book is a concrete particular. My coffee cup, it's just things in the world, physical objects. In particular, these things provide sensory inputs or compute functions for the hyper-intelligent system. So examples would be brains, microchips, entire supercomputers, and so on. I think we will be wired in, in some fashion, 
to the cloud. But it is too early to tell whether the sensors will be physically embedded in the brain over the next 30 years, or even if that's the direction that radical futuristic brain enhancement takes, or whether we'll be wired or hooked in just through external wearables. But let me talk trends. So Musk is the most famous case of someone developing brain chips. And he said that humans can keep up with AI by having a merger of biological intelligence and machine intelligence. And to this end, a few years ago, he founded a company called Neuralink with the aim of having eventual implantable chips allowing data from your brain to travel wirelessly to your digital devices. So you can get videos of this on YouTube. First, he was doing it to pigs. The chip's actually in the skull. It's embedded in the skull. It's not actually physically, they didn't remove any parts of the brain, right? The neat thing about his technology, uh, he has a sort of um, very, you know, probably one of the best approaches to these polymers for um, mapping brain activity. And he can actually capture more neural activity than his competitors, I believe. And recently he just uploaded a new video of a monkey. And so you can find that on YouTube. Well, there's actually a lot of current work on these issues. So um, many of you have probably heard of the amazing artificial hippocampus that Ted Berger has been working on with DARPA and USC. Um, he's been working on it for about 15 years now. And I'm excited to say that it's there, um, you know, to help individuals who have very bad memory problems. And it's now in phase two clinical trials in humans. In humans. So this is really exciting. Um, and with success, um, you know, the problem is going to be uh, permanently embedding the chips in the head and you know, that may draw from some of Neuralink's work. Well, notice that I'm excited about the possible use of brain chips for therapy, right? I mean, we can't get this quick enough. Think about locked in patients, um, you know, and think about brain gates work um, on paralyzed individuals. But Musk has said that he wants to see this kind of technology used as commonplace as LASIK to enhance the brains of ordinary people. And he has two reasons for this. The first is to keep up with technological unemployment. So he believes that AI will outmode us in the workplace over the next you know, 10 to 30 years, like it will increasingly outmode us. I agree. I don't think it'll be easy to replace these jobs um, the way some people do. Um, but he thinks that a solution to this is to get humans to use brain implant technology. He also thinks, and this is coming from a person who is very worried about super intelligence and has actually donated a lot of money to AI safety. He's worried that humans won't be able to keep track of the complex computations and behaviors of future super intelligences. So this is intended to be a solution. Okay, so that's a sort of state of play with respect to um, brain chips in three minutes. Um, wearables are interesting. Um, people don't realize, I think, that wearables will happen way quicker than brain chips and that they will easily uh, be extensions of the surveillance capitalist economy commoditizing your biometric data. I mean, that's already started um, just with Ancestry.com and Fitbit, for example. I mean, it's just constant. Um, but as soon as wearable technology hits, it will be much easier. I mean, there already are wearables. I mean, there's the Apple Watch, but I mean, you know, a more extensive and widespread use of wearables. So we're right now, for example, about a month away from beta testing over at Facebook, a thought detection device um, that collects motor initiation commands from the brain, okay? So this is a technology designed primarily by Thomas Reardon, who um, was one of the creators of Internet Explorer. I learned about it because he, he contacted me for a meeting. He probably regrets it because I've been complaining about his technology ever since Facebook bought it. 
Um, it's a fascinating technology. So it's a wristband. It's going to be unrolled, I believe, in the context of virtual reality. And what it does is when you have a thought uh, that you want to raise a finger, they set it up so that you don't even have to raise your finger. You just make a motor command and the wristband catches the command and then your avatar on the screen raises the finger. And I mean, it's amazingly provocative from the vantage point of philosophy of mind. I mean, he even asserts in one of his talks that we could have the arms of an octopus. And it makes me wonder what is the limits of human cognitive capacity you know, as we move into a future with these kinds of wearable technologies? Could I really, with my mind, generate an extra arm and actually use it efficiently? Fascinating stuff. But unfortunately, Facebook bought it. Um, and as you could probably tell, I'm not a big fan of them. And I do see this as becoming part and parcel of what I call a thought data economy, a possible world in which our thoughts are sold to the highest bidder, beginning with facts about the brain's activity in the motor strip. And that's in beta testing. Um, I actually work with the head of the AI Congress caucus here in Washington. I work with Congress on AI policy. We actually had a call about this with Facebook recently, alerting them to possible human rights abuses over in China and a bunch of even you know, social issues in the United States with this technology. I mean, just imagine this kind of technology um, that is in the hands of a Chinese government used to track dissidents. Okay, so anyway, why would you then, given what I said, even give your thought data? Well, there are several reasons why people may eventually hook in. There's an advantage to having instant access to a global intelligence network. Uh, you know, fast access to information, expanded intelligence and sensory capacities, possibly, and so on. Another scenario is that surveillance capitalism prevails and people just want to do it, just like they want to use social media. Um, further, people might have the false belief that if they upload their brains, they can have memory backups and live forever. I've argued that that's not correct, but some people, some people believe it. People might also do it to keep their jobs, as Musk pointed out. People might do it um, therapeutically or for the purpose of what, what some people call cosmetic neurology to sculpt their brains. So for enhancement purposes. And finally, it could be a government control mechanism. If any one of these situations obtains, then a large population of nodes would exist. Okay. So that gives, gives us the premises and conclusion of the global brain argument. Um, I don't know how much time I have left. I don't know if I should just stop now or if I should elaborate on things a little more. You, um, have, uh, you have at least a good five minutes left and you can, oh, uh, okay. you can take as long as 10 minutes. But if you can keep it to, to 10, under 10 minutes, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was the kind of elaboration. Now, I do have some provisional reactions to raise. I think there's a lot of possibilities here to talk about, but you we probably want to know if it's good or bad. And I'm afraid I don't know. I mean, a dystopian possibility is obviously that we are forced to participate in hyperintelligence, but we have a decreased quality of life. Nevertheless, that you know we're sensors in a larger network and we're, we're manipulated by a global brain as depicted in science fiction. So, um, you know, there's a whole genre of science fiction called cyberpunk, um, you know, with authors like William Gibson and Rudy Recker that depict these kinds of scenarios. A point of contrast, though, would be a sort of curse Wileyan universe, a technotopia where we actually merge with artificial intelligence and reach a higher level of intelligence and consciousness ourselves. World resource scarcity goes away because superintelligence is benevolent and so on. Well, in my book, 
artificial you, I actually argue that we can't really merge with artificial intelligence in the way that Kurzweil envisions for all sorts of reasons. Um, here's my book. I, I have a couple copies here. If anybody wants a free coffee, <laughs> just email me. Um, so I do think, however, that we could benefit from limited integration. Um, enhancements, for example, could enable, enable radical life extension and certain superhuman abilities, certain cognitive and perceptual upgrades. And I'll discuss which ones as time allows. So the social impact is uncertain, but what I can tell you is that AI regulations will be absolutely key to how this plays out. Well, is it a form of super consciousness? I mean, look, Dawkins has this view. Um, he says, it's not obvious to me the replacement of our species by our own technological creations would be a bad thing. But given what I've said about the social impact, I think we need to hold on. Furthermore, you might wonder, would the global brain be conscious? Um, and I explored consciousness in machines in artificial you, but let me point out a few little interesting tidbits here. So first of all, the global brain would have conscious nodes, us, but I don't think that entails that it is conscious. I think that's a metaphysically interesting possibility that there could be a distributed system that's got pockets of consciousness, but itself is not conscious. Anyway, um, I'm skeptical, however, that machines or, you know, algorithms will instantiate consciousness anytime soon in a more global sense. And I'll just quickly mention a few considerations. So that's the topic of the first half of artificial you, machine consciousness. Um, there are a lot of reasons why I'm skeptical. I'm not saying that machines will never be conscious. I think it's too far into the future though, um, you know, for it to even be an issue right now for the global brain. So first of all, we, we don't even know the kind of microchips that would be utilized in this kind of computing. So we don't know the substrate, we don't know its properties. Um, so we don't know what consciousness is in humans. Um, so we don't really understand why we're conscious. Merely setting up a system that has working memory and attention or something like a global workspace isn't, to me, is not sufficient for creating a system that is what philosophers call phenomenally conscious. That is, and I, I better be very clear here, a system that has the felt quality of experience. So when I've worked with government projects on consciousness, we've always distinguished between two types of consciousness. One is this kind of philosopher's sense of the felt quality of experience. So when you hear your favorite piece of music or when you smell the aroma of your espresso, it feels like something to be you from the inside. There's another sense of consciousness that people sometimes talk about in the machine consciousness community where all we care about is that the machine functions in certain ways that we function when we're conscious. So for example, we have a global workspace, working memory and attentional systems that seem to be particularly intriguing in the context of consciousness. But I'm saying that having a machine like that, an example would be Stan Franklin's LIDA or the kind of machine that um, my colleagues, my new colleagues, um, Manuel Blum and Lenore Blum, they're working on a machine that instantiates a global workspace. I don't think that will be sufficient for that felt quality of experience that philosophers talk about. But from the vantage point of solving serious problems with AI reasoning, that's all we need. We don't need a machine that feels. So the upshot is, I think that these issues that I presented today 
are somewhat unrelated. They don't require that felt quality of experience in a machine. It's good enough if the machine is intelligent. There are too many issues on the table that are just unsettled with respect to creating a machine that has genuine, true, phenomenal consciousness. And um, anyway, I think the tech companies will cheap out on true phenomenal consciousness once they achieve smart machines with adequate causal reasoning. And I think they'll do that way before. Okay, so if you want the global brain to be conscious in the philosopher's sense, begin making your case now it will read your papers. <laughs> okay, so, you know, there's a whole lot I could talk about. I could talk about the extended mind. You might just want to ask me that. But I think basically this issue of the global brain, it raises a lot of unappreciated questions about consciousness. So, you know, here's some assertions that I'm inclined to adopt based on this paper together with my recent book, man is not the measure of all intelligent systems. Um, we shouldn't anthropomorphize intelligence. It will lose us to miss alien intelligence, <laughs> as I learned when I work with NASA. And it will also potentially lead us to miss greater intelligences on earth, like a global brain. Second, consciousness may not even be the measure of intelligent systems. The greatest intelligences may not be conscious ones in the philosopher's sense of phenomenal consciousness. And this is drawing from my work with NASA on alien intelligence, where I argued that the smartest aliens will actually be super intelligent AIs that may not be conscious. Furthermore, I think that the idea of Darwinian evolution versus intelligent design by some sort of God is a false dichotomy. The evolution of the global brain is non-Darwinian. It's partly the product of intelligent design, but it's obviously non-theistically designed. It's designed by us and itself at some, you know, if it has recursive self-improvement algorithms where the constraints on its evolution are principles of micro and macro economics, corporate profit considerations. If you wanna know what the mind of a super intelligent AI will be like, follow the money. Moore's law is an obvious evolutionary constraint if you believe in Moore's law or something like it, as are AI regulations, ironically. Okay. And I also think that there's a new category of intelligence we might pay some attention to as well. So we often think that there's a dichotomy between individual intelligence and the intelligence of the collective. So the intelligence of the bee versus the intelligence of the swarm. Well, I wanna just point out that we wouldn't in the context of the global brain be unenhanced like bees. We would already be part of the collective as cyborgs. Further, there's an unexplored area which I call hybrid intelligence. Think of the information flow between the cyborg and the collective. That is the information that the sensors in the enhanced brain or body contribute as nodes in a global brain to the whole algorithm. And how the information from the global brain flows to the cyborg system impacting the person's consciousness and cognition. Further, we can't assume here that the person is at all identical to the cyborg. A clear example of this is a situation where someone shows up to work, puts on a sort of intellectual exoskeleton or tertiary brain, as Elon Musk calls it, and then when she leaves her job, she takes it off and goes home. Okay, so I think I'm gonna stop here. Um, <laughs> there's just so much to talk about, um, but I'm dying to hear your, your reactions. Thank you. All right, well, th thanks a lot, Susan. You're right on time. Uh, uh, yes, I think you definitely deserve a round of virtual uh, applause. Uh, yes, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot to talk about. I'm sure this has raised a lot of discussion and question. 
So now we would have two comments from from uh, Karina and one from Jonathan. So you both have like between five or ten minutes. Please stick it uh, under ten minutes, please. Um, and I just want to say, I think if you uh, since you've discussing that, but there was also the book. I think I hope it's okay with you. But if they raise points also about things that you've introduced in your book, I hope this is okay. fine. Also, you can answer to that uh, as well. Okay, all right. So that's great. So uh, Karina, uh, whenever you are ready. Okay, well, um, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. And it's really nice to hear your talk, Susan. And um, I actually assigned a few chapters of your book uh, for two of my courses here at the University of Toronto. So I was excited to be asked by Dominic um, to join today's discussion. So uh, thanks, Dominic, as well. Um, and I've always felt like we approach questions about AI in a similar way. Uh, so often from the perspective of a philosopher of mind, raising the question about how does AI uh, or how might AI impact our minds or impact sort of our cognitive lives as humans and even our flourishing as humans. So um, this could be, you know, intentionally through some kind of invasive brain computer interface as Susan explores or through the creation of autonomous systems that outpace us or replace our cognitive capacity. So I, yeah, I just appreciate that um, Susan uh, with your approach through the book and through this talk as well. Um, and I think for that reason, I'm often sympathetic to the angle you take on a lot of issues. And I, I find that we share a lot of the same concerns um, that you raise about machine consciousness and about the use of um, <clears throat> particularly digital cognitive enhancement technologies. Um, so as Dominic mentioned, I'd prepared a few questions about the chapters of your book, um, but your talk was on a, on a different provocative topic. So um, I'm gonna try to raise, <laughs> no, that's great. I'm gonna try to raise questions kind of to both. So uh, sort of adapt as I go. So the first questions I was going to ask were about um, the artificial intelligence consciousness test that you raise in your book. And so I'll sort of ask a version of that question. So you had mentioned that you don't think that the global brain would be conscious, but I wonder if something that massive wouldn't be likely to pass something like the ACT. And so you do say that passing the ACT would be a sufficient condition for phenomenal consciousness, I believe. Um, and so, yeah, so I guess my question is, is the problem with something like the global brain that it's just too distributed of a system to pass ACT? Um, or, or so, so does that make the test sort of irrelevant for an entity like that? Um, it's obviously not boxed in in the way that you describe. Um, so I think that, you know, that might be sort of a way to respond, I guess. But um, I guess I'm thinking that a database that's that large or even a database that's as large as GPT-3, let's say, would have a pretty high performance on um, the ACT questions that you post on page 55 of your book. And so I think part of my raising this is my intuition is that ACT sets too low of a performance threshold um, and that even a boxing in strategy. So even if we were to box in something like a GPT-3 system, you know, we could feel still face something like gaming problems. So in other words, you could imagine a, a dedicated programmer who tries to find ways to optimize for the specific behaviors that ACT is testing for. Um, because ACT is ultimately a behavioral test, it's going to be susceptible to this type of gaming. So, um, so yeah, I was interested in what you thought about that. And then I'll also just turn to the global brain hypothesis and raise a few more questions about um, these ideas. So one question that comes to mind as a way to sort of put pressure on you is, why should we care? So what are the real risks of this global brain actualizing? And I think I worry that the argument is maybe a bit speculative or that the scenario is a low probability even, that it's hard to justify being worried about concerns like this that are maybe long-term and low prob with a low probability over concerns that are maybe more near-term and that have higher probability, like some of the more immediate concerns around the use of um, AI. Um, and then sort of a related thought, I guess, uh, something that you raised is that maybe we're actually already there, right? Maybe we actually already have a global brain. Um, and when you couple something like Clark and Chalmers extended mind thesis with, you know, all of us are probably clutching our phones, even as I'm talking, or at least all of us probably are in an arm's length away from our phone right now. 
I bet most of us could pick it up without, without standing up. So what makes the global brain any different? Why does it matter if it's inside my head or outside my head, right? <laughs> and so in a sense, we're already connected even without the invasive technology. And so what's the critical shift then? And I'm kind of picturing, you know, what comes to my mind is like the, the covers of Hobbes's Leviathan, where it illustrates that we're all sort of part of the system and that you can't escape it. And, you know, whether it's in our heads or not. And then um, I guess maybe just to end, I'll sort of shift gears and ask a question that falls more into the domain of applied ethics. And that's, what do you think about some of the companies that are monetizing cognitive enhancement or even the promise of mind uploading? So the companies you mentioned like Kernel and Neuralink, um, do you think those companies should face more scrutiny and regulation um, because of some of the promises they make, like some of the digital afterlife companies, for example, now that are selling these promises of living forever? Um, and so what do you think is the best? I'm assuming that you do think that they require some regulation. And what do you think is the best way to protect consumers from these potential harms? Um, okay, so I could ask more questions, but I think that's basically what I wanted to share. And I'll probably jump into the discussion later. So thank you. Wow, do right, I thank you. Answer, uh, can you can we wait after Jonathan's comment and then you can also uh, everything okay. all together? Thank you and so, and uh, all my apologies, Karina, because I forgot to introduce you. So Karina is um, is a philosopher of cognitive science and artificial intelligence, and you're an assistant professor at the Institute for the History and Philosophy of Science and Technology at the University of of uh, Toronto. And so your recent research deals with uh, topics such as uh, can consciousness extend. How does AI pose an existential threat? The framework, you've developed suggested frameworks for, for developing responsible AI. Uh, you also teach and wrote papers on the limits of machine intelligence, what I think is very fascinating. I was that close from registering to that course at the IHPST when I saw your, when I checked your website. So anyways, all my apologies for, for, for forgetting to introduce you properly. Well, and so I now- her. Um, I read one of your papers too recently on the extended mind and I loved it. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. That's yeah. so nice of you. Thanks for the introduction as well, Dominic. Yeah, sure. No problem. And then, so the second comment is from uh, Jonathan Simon, who is the assistant, assistant professor, sorry, at the Département de Philosophie of the Université de, de Montréal. And uh, Jonathan is also affiliated with the Center of Research and Ethics and a research group also on normative uh, ethics uh, and uh, the NYU Global Institute for Advanced Study Project on uh, Space, Time and Consciousness um, and other also um, groups uh, dealing more uh, with the research issues in, in metaphysics. Um, so his primary research in the, is in the metaphysics of mind but he has also worked on the philosophy of artificial intelligence, the metaphysics of science, and uh, uh, fields such as applied ontology, but uh, moral, also moral psychology, value theory, and legal and political philosophy. And I may also say on a personal note that Jonathan, uh, because we know uh, each other a bit, but has a paper on, on AlphaGo and whether it is conscious or not, oh. right, if I remember correctly. So I hope you don't mind me saying this. But oh. uh, so please fill us, uh, I fill us I a bit more that. about. The, yeah, how that paper is coming along also, Jonata. Sure, thanks, Dominique. Um, yeah, and Susan, on that issue, I'm, I'm sort of more in the minimalist. I think they might already be phenomenally conscious uh, camp. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I'd be happy to, I'd love to talk to you more about that. But here, let me just focus on, um, I think maybe what would be most helpful would be for me to elaborate on, I had sort of, I think the same reaction that Karina had to the new stuff, which is that it's interesting, but I'd like to hear more about you know, what, why should I care about this issue in particular? Um, so here's some, just some contrasts that might help us all discuss that. Um, you, when you say like, hey, let's take a step back and do some network analysis. And then we find that as a whole, a system has a certain kind of property that you wouldn't have noticed if you were just looking at the trees. Um, you know, there's, there's one, there's one um, kind of game there, which is that you're saying there's some new functionality. There's some new understanding that we have of the whole. Um, via that network analysis. Um, you can contrast that with a view where you say, hey, look, uh, hey, technically, hey, look, this thing, like the, this part qualifies as intelligent. So, you know, the part's connected to the whole. So, hey, the whole counts as intelligent too. But, you know, you don't really understand something new. So if we sort of say, hey, look, take GPT-3, um, plug GPT-3 into some Google brain or even just some, you know, 
search functionality or some internet of things operative, you know, just sync it up with a bunch of stuff. And then, hey, what, oh, you've got already a, uh, some kind of global brain. In that case, it's interesting to note that this intelligent thing is, uh, is intelligent, but the idea that it's global isn't somehow like, it's not like it's only because of the globalness that it's intelligent. It's not like there's some new form of intelligence that's only come into play because it's global. Um, so my first question is, are you thinking that um, there's gonna be some kind of, you know, change of state, you know, some new form of intelligence that arises. Okay, so that, that's interesting. And I'd, I'd maybe like to hear more about why you think that, especially since the, mo the motives you give are more like, hey, you can imagine, you know, GPT-7, uh, plug it up to your refrigerator and my refrigerator and maybe your Neuralink and my Neuralink and we've got a new thing, you know, what exactly is gonna be like uh, the, the, the qualitative shift there, why won't it just be, hey, you know, it's GPT-7 and now it can also buy milk for me. Um, uh, so that's sort of question one. And then question two more specifically is about the idea of what, what it is to be a node and why we should care whether or not people are nodes as opposed to merely, you know, agents that interact with the system without being parts of it. So sort of top level contrast, should I, is that a verbal question? Like, or should I actually, Think it's important to know whether it's like so given that there is such a you know big global cloudy um intelligent system of some sort out of there probably to save that we'll all be interacting with it um and uh, there are a lot of interesting questions that arise then and there you know the questions about thought privacy and so on i think arise without even using the word node it doesn't matter it doesn't seem to matter whether we're nodes just for the assessment of the applied ethical um, questions. So I'm kind of wondering what's important about the claim that we will be nodes. And then I think what it would it be for us to be nodes? Well, maybe there's a claim about, um, you know, we're loaning our compute power to the system. Um, and that'd be interesting, but of course, like I, just as with, uh, you know, some kind of crypto mining thing running in the back of my Candy Crush app or uh, you know my torrent uh, running some streaming on the back of my computer. There are lots of ways to loan a cloudy system um, some compute and uh, you know maybe it'll turn out that using my brain energy will will be better but maybe it's actually more efficient to just like let it use my hard drive on my laptop for a few hours a day instead and like it's hard to see that anything deep is going to hinge on that unless like it really turns out that brain metabolic energy is like way more efficient and then it becomes a scarce commodity. So, you know, like we are being harvested like in the matrix or something like that. Um, otherwise there's obviously like sort of idea of training data, you know, um, the way that uh, my, my stories on Instagram and my YouTube videos are already unsupervised training data. Um, presumably if a neural link is taking a multi-dimensional snap um, picture of everything that's happening in me at all times, that's gonna be a much richer stream of training data. But there, there's a question of, again, of so what, like it's already got a whole amount of training data. You know, Susan, you yourself have noticed that, uh, you know, if, if we're dealing with a system that's already highly intelligent, it may already be able to automate a lot of the things that we might think you need that training data for, you know, how do humans make decisions? Like, how do I classify dogs from cats? How do I talk? How do I walk? How do I understand, you know, even moral judgment, all these things. You might think, well, by the time we get to GPT-25, that stuff will already be sorted out and automated, in which case it's not obvious that the fact that the system's getting this extra training data like matters from the purpose of like what's going on with the network. It might be more important for the applied ethical questions because it's got a much more integrated picture of me. But again, that brings me back to the question, but there it doesn't matter per se that I'm a node, it just matters that it knows all this stuff about me. Um, so yeah, and that's the main thing I'd like to hear more about uh, is, is how those things all um, fit together and I'll, I'll stop there so we have more time to talk. Super, oh my gosh. Okay, wow, I don't even know where to begin. Do I get to respond now? Yes, you do. Okay. You need to answer each and single question that was asked before we move on, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Well, I'm absolutely thrilled for the feedback uh, and, and such great feedback. Um, 
gosh, I don't even know where to start. Okay. Um, so I think I'll just try to go in order. Um, so, all right. So first off, there was a question about one of my consciousness tests that I proposed in the book. Um, and I published the questions, I think, in the book too, that you can ask the AI. And they're, they're like philosophical questions about whether it has the felt quality of experience, whether it understands the idea of the mind or soul being apart from the body, like even if there's not really an immaterial mind or soul, just that it understands it. And so um, I think it's right to think that um, these deep learning systems like GPT-3, and in fact, definitely the global brain, you really can't run it. They wouldn't be good candidates. And I, I said that in the book, I said that any system that has access to a database that involves facts about human consciousness or even political facts about like say the ethics of utilitarianism, that it's sensitive to privileging sentient beings in the utilitarian calculus, any of that stuff, just forget it. Like it, it would, if it's super intelligent or even a savant system, it will know how to act if it wants to, if it cares. Um, and I think that there's a limited utility to that test for that reason. And that test is most appropriate, honestly. Like when I think of that test, I honestly think of um, Rachel and Blade Runner and that test, I don't know how many people saw um, when Rachel's being tested for consciousness she's asked a battery of questions. And it does seem in a situation like that, insofar as the system doesn't have a baked in database about the issues and you're able to measure the reactions because the, you know, the system's a sort of human-like Android that you might have some good luck with it. That wasn't the only test I proposed in the book. Um, I think the chip test might be useful um, in the context of, um, you know, global brain consciousness, um, because it would tell us in principle whether microchips could be the right stuff to underlie conscious experience. Okay, so um, I won't suggest Tononi's measure because I'm skeptical about that, uh, Phi. But if anybody wants to ask me more questions, I'll just, instead of ranting about it, I'll wait for questions. Okay. Um, so both Jonathan and Karina, did I pronounce your name right, Karina? Okay, all right. Um, you both had a single, a, a, a similar reaction. It was, I'll, I'll characterize it as this kind of so what challenge, <laughs> which is, you know, that's good because it means the argument's not so shitty. <laughs> but I have to prove that it matters. That's a better situation to be in when you write an argument and give it the next morning. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. Okay, yeah, I, I live in the domain of, you know, the ethical implications of AI a lot of the time, which I blend together with the metaphysics and philosophy of mind. And so, yeah, I'm worried about the ethics for sure, but, and I'll talk about that in a second. But I mean, think about it like this. There's not an AI worry budget, as I call it. So often people who uh, are worried about the control problem of super intelligence, the more futuristic types, get uh, complained about by the people who are worried about more here and now issues like algorithmic discrimination. There's not a war. <laughs> it can all be scary. It can all be important. But you might wonder though, and Karina raised this issue, I list three premises and, you know, they're speculative um, because, you know, they involve the future. Now, I happen to think that each one has at least some plausibility. I really do. Um, but I do think that when you have a situation with a potentially catastrophic or humanity changing conclusion, and I'll go into that in a minute, even the most remote possibility, and I don't think it's that remote, means that you should plan and act and be aware. Okay. 
All right. Um, so what are the social implications then? Well, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, suppose you're a node and you have a brain chip. And over the years, you start offloading your memories onto the cloud or storing them on the chip of your child's second year of life. And then, but you're a grad student and so you don't have a lot of money and you start getting notices from the service provider, either the cloud provider or the chip maker that they're gonna cancel your subscription because you can't pay. That sucks. That, that, that's, that's scary because that's ownership of thoughts. And then suppose that data is sold without your consent and used against you. Or suppose your chip gets you to do things that you don't wanna do. I've been meaning to write a paper about this issue called My Chip Made Me Do It, about the free will issue with this. Um, but let me just, for a here and now example, I don't know how many of you saw the social dilemma. It's really good. And um, Tristan, uh, one of the people interviewed, talks about how he developed the like button on Facebook, I believe, and how basically they were utilizing understandings of how to manipulate people and get people addicted. So principles of addiction involving, you know, serotonin and dopamine and whatnot. Well, if you're a node, you're in immediate instantaneous, well, not instantaneous, but quick, two-way interaction with systems and you don't even know what is necessarily coming in. It's also a cybersecurity nightmare. I mean, the list of potential nightmares um, coupled with like human rights abuses um, in you know, places like the United States even, if you know, we had bad leadership or even someone in the Pentagon who just wants to collect data. I mean, so I do think these are catastrophic potentials um, in terms of risk. Now, I'm also worried that buying in to the use of brain chips might lead us in the wrong direction. I think there's some bad metaphysics that underlies the idea that we could replace all of our brain or even a large part of our brain with chips and still survive. I think it's false. I've written a couple op-eds on this. So, um, you know, if you think that wiping out your brain isn't going to impact your existence, is it, and it's not because you think there's a soul, I'd be surprised. Like if someone, you know, we really have to think about the relationship between the brain and our individuality, our personhood. Um, and I think it's, I don't think we could survive if we remove parts of our biological brain to a certain degree. We might be able to get away with removing some. From a metaphysics standpoint also, it's not clear to me that we would even be the same person we were before if we utilized many, many, many different enhancements. So I think connecting as a node raises the kind of issues that I raised in my book involving personal identity. Now, everything I said is talking the, about the context of brain chips, but I have a lot of privacy worries. All the political kind of applied ethicsy issues arise also in the context of wearable devices like Facebook's um, wristband. Okay, um, there are a lot of other sort of big ticket philosophical issues that I think become interesting too. Um, the extended mind debate, for example, issues involving whether an intelligent system could not be conscious but have conscious parts and so on. Um, okay, uh, let's see. I don't know if I'm really responding to all of this. I mean, so there's a, a point um, I'm still on Karina's points, really, um, that we are already there. So, you know, who cares? Well, I think the ethical implications are important. So, you know, I don't like doing the we are there stuff. I mean, yes, our data is being sold to the highest bidder right now, but that doesn't mean that it's 
good. Yes, the mind may already be extended. Um, I personally, from my vantage point though, concerning the extended mind debate, um, I'm not convinced by the fact that I have a cell phone and use it to remember things that my mind is extended. However, I am absolutely convinced that from a metaphysical standpoint, it's very possible to extend the mind using brain chip technology. So I think the mind extends beyond the brain in cases like the Ted Berger test subjects to the extent that there is an integrated chip or a fairly integrated chip. Now, does that mean there's extended consciousness? There, I'm not sure because I'm not sure if microchips can underlie conscious experience, but let me say that it's interesting that Andy Clark and David Chalmers are often pretty skeptical about extended consciousness, whereas I think it's an open empirical question about machine consciousness. So if we could put a chip in the head in parts of the brain that underlie conscious experience, then I think we have extended consciousness because in principle, you see, that chip could be outside of the brain. It's sort of irrelevant whether it's in or out. In fact, in the early experiments like Ted Berger's experiment, the chip's outside of the brain. It doesn't matter metaphysically. So I'm actually more optimistic about extended consciousness. And I would say even furthermore, it's a testable hypothesis, which nobody talks about. I say this in a paper I could send you that I published recently with Joe Karabi. Um, Okay, gosh, there's so much to talk about. I don't know how I'm going to do all this justice. Um, oh, how should we regulate kernel and neuraling? Oh, well, we should regulate, and we do, um, you know, testing in humans, and we should make sure that animals are treated ethically. I'm all for what they're doing. And actually, the president of kernel is great. He, and, and I actually am a big fan of Elon Musk. I have a couple of his cars here, <laughs> very fast. Yeah, so he's, he's pretty cool too. Um, but I think that AI regulations need to happen at the level of government and not be, I mean, I don't think we should have the widespread use of brain enhancement therapies without it being regulated in the United States, for example, by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, which I'm actually married to an FDA regulatory attorney, which is convenient. And medical devices and even enhancement devices like that would have to be regulated. And one thing I proposed with a member of Congress, because we're working on some legislation on these issues, is that um, people actually need to be advised about the underlying philosophical issues as well. So maybe get philosophers some jobs as, as philosophical advisors in the future, you know, so that people who want to go into, you know, say a cosmetic neurology center would actually um, think twice before adding too many brain enhancements. Okay, um, digital afterlife stuff, I think that's, I think that's crazy and sad, actually. I've given a lot of media interviews on that. Um, okay, so Jonathan, <laughs> I finally get into yours. Um, so you asked about phase transitions and you know that's exactly the kind of work I wanna do for this book, actually. I wanna look at this um, from the, a mathematical perspective. Um, you know, super intelligence is said to be different in the sense that it's a domain general system and a savant system would be like that as well. So, I mean, that would obviously be distinct from today's situation, at least as far as we know, where we have very domain specific um, systems on the internet um, and things are very scattered. Um, I think there's a really interesting issue here about at what point, or, you know, it, we, it's not even that there needs to be a firm point, um, but just, you know, there could be a fuzzy boundary, but I mean, when do systems get to the point where they tend to be, um, you know, flexible domain general AIs with beyond human capacities in various respects? And, you know, to me that, that does sound phase, like a phase transition of sort. Um, anyway, I, I'm not doing that justice though yet, but, um, you know, I hope to pursue more issues in that. Okay. Um, what is it to be a node and who cares? Um, 
well, I think I kind of touched on that um, from an efficacy standpoint. Um, as well as the AI safety stuff. Um, oh, 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 I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to emphasize that I think this issue matters deeply to AI safety, the global brain thing. I mean, it gives us a sense of the detection of and shape of super intelligent systems. And I think we need to anticipate this in salute, trying to solve the control problem. And I think it remains unanticipated, at least by the people I've talked to. So, you know, for example, I really enjoyed Stuart Russell's recent book. And I mentioned to Stuart, you know, how do we think of all this when in fact the humans themselves will be connected to the artificial intelligences and he had no answer. So, you know, if you care about the super intelligent safety issue, I think this is important. Okay, all right. I think I'm gonna stop here and you're just gonna to have to tell me the different things I failed to answer. <laughs> but thank you so much. All right, perfect. Well, thank you for your for your answers. I remember you said at some point, so we should give philosophers jobs. So that's a very nice suggestion. I think Google tried that; it did not work very well for all sorts of reasons. But uh, I couldn't I couldn't agree more with uh, with you on that. Um, so now it's the time for for questions from the public. We have a good thirty minutes. Uh, so again, I, I, I repeat just how we're going to proceed. So if you want to ask a question, just write your name in the chat and then I will uh, give you the opportunity to ask a question yourself. If you write a question in the chat, uh, then I will simply ask the question for you. I think your question, as Susan mentioned, so uh, can be on her talk, a specific talk for today or more general question about the topic that she discusses in her, in her, in her recent book uh, as well. So I don't know if somebody wants to start. I, maybe I can start and throw off a, a question myself. In fact, a lot of the questions I had on your on your talk uh, were like um, touched points that uh, Karina and Jonathan mentioned. I was pretty much in the also in the we're all aren't we already there and the um, <laughs> so what or why does it matter perspective? Um, I think I, I, if I may make a general comment, I think being very clear about like the implications of the global brain is really an important part of the argument. Otherwise, we're not sure whether, because as I was like, as you we were presenting the argument and I was seeing premises one to three, I was, I did, some people here may have a different opinion, but I did not think they were particularly provocative, like in the sense that uh, it, it seems very plausible that something like that will happen. In fact, I, I, I even wonder like, to what extent we're already there. And I think to answer that question, it's really, uh, it's really um, to know if we're already there or not, it, it's, we really need to be precise about that, that node question, whether humans can be node in a system or not. Um, maybe I failed to understand that when you initially presented the argument, but uh, so during presentation, I had the impression that simply having a smart device or a smart watch would be sufficient but then you seem to suggest that no, you need something like some, you need more than that, like maybe a chip in your brain or you need piece of, pieces of your thoughts to be sort of processed elsewhere or stored elsewhere. Anyway, so, I, so to make a concrete question, a clear, a clear question, I wonder if it's possible for you to clarify that. Like what's the, tr what's the threshold? At what point can we consider that a human is a node in the system or not? I think a lot rests on that question. And on the on the so what uh, the so what uh, dimension of the argument. Okay, yeah, um, that's great because when I actually write this up, like it'll be in the context of a chapter called Borg versus Buddha or something like that. And so you know, I know how to scare the shit out of people. I'm really good at it. <laughs> so you know, I watch so much science fiction. That's all. Like last night when I was writing this. We were watching the Borg episode on Star Trek, one of the Borg episodes. So, you know, I've got so much fodder for this. Um, okay, so on the node question. Yeah, I went pretty fast. So anything could be a node insofar as it sends input into say, for example, suppose it's a deep learning system, the input layer, or what if it's a mid middle layer node and what it does is it operates as something like a sub processor, I mean, you know, anything could be a node, really. Anything that's capable of computation. Mm -hmm. 
but at what point can we consider that that a human is a node in the system? Like what kind of link do you need or what kind of data exchange do you need to consider that? If you're saying that just having a smart device, like a smartphone is not sufficient, well, like at what point? The, node. the phone would be the node. Um, I think once, once our biometric data is collected automatically from something, um, you know, okay. our thought data, if you will, once our thought data is being collected by a chip or even a wearable device, like the one I sketched with Facebook, then I would be yes. willing to take, you know, anytime the computations in our head are directly going in as inputs or processor processing units into the system, I would say it's a no, that thing is a node. Okay, okay. I, I may still have questions, but I'll, I'll first go to, I think Martin uh, wanted to ask a question. So we'll go there and maybe Jonathan and Karina also wanted to come back. So I'll let them speak first and we'll see how cool. it goes. Okay, also cool. people that uh, in the audience feel free to, I think it's a perfect opportunity to ask all your very difficult question about consciousness because we have someone very knowledgeable but is also able to explain that in, in a way that is extremely accessible so uh, I don't, know don't hesitate that. to ask uh, to ask a question i'm raising the expectations here susan i hope you i, I hope know you <laughs> okay martin i'll try i'll yeah. try Thank, thanks uh, susan for for your talk i was wondering if you have considered to um, uh, uh, to make the global brain uh, with non-human, non, non, uh, non non-human animals, oh. like adding because maybe they could be node to and what kind of difference it would make if the, this global brain was not only uh, uh, with human brain, so it's just a kind of suggestion of a question. Do you have any? Any idea on that? Oh uh, yeah, it could be. Um, so consider uh, Thomas DeMars's project at the University of Florida recently went underground, uh, fascinated me because um, it was literally a brain in a vat. So he scraped cortical cells off of uh, a rat brain, cultured them in a dish, and put them in a deep learning system and had that animat, they're called animats, as a computational device that was later able to fly um, flight simulators for the military with success. And then it went underground. Yes. I mean, think about um, Battlestar Galactica. So the computational systems were synthetic, but biological. Like that whole line is kind of messy, right? It could turn out, I mean, you want to make a conscious computer. I mean, maybe the way to do it is to make it sort of have a biological layer to it. And I mean, maybe you could have chips in the animals too, or, or smart oh, yeah. clothes and stuff yeah. like that. I mean, well, first of all, there already are chips in animals, right? Over at Neuralink, you can see the videos. So they're at monkey brains now. And of course, um, that's the usual route of testing them before they go to human subjects anyway. But you might also think that um, you could uplift the animals. And here I'm thinking of the ideas of the science fiction writer and futurist David Brin, who has a series of books on uplifting, uplifting the intellectual abilities of animals. And I'm not saying that's ethical. <laughs> Someone will try it though. <laughs> For sure. I, I have a dog here that needs it. <laughs> okay, um, I, we now have a question from Joshua Benjo. So Joshua. Hi, thanks uh, Susan. Um, I, I, I want to come back to the uh, felt consciousness, as you called it, um, and your, um, uh, your, your comment about um, that, that machine, in, machine consciousness as people are thinking about it these days with uh, maybe something related to global workspace theory is, is unlikely to give the kind of, that kind of consciousness. Um, so 
here's maybe uh, a, a different argument I'd like to hear you uh, about. Uh, besides the fact that people like me are working on building these kinds of um, uh, functionality, um, it seems reasonable to assume that uh, th this uh, uh, aspect of consciousness, is, you know, is there for a reason that evolution has put it in us because either it directly gives us an advantage or it's a side effect of something that gives us an advantage. And if, if it is so, then there is an underlying mechanism, which as we make progress in neuroscience and, and COXI and AI, um, we will figure out. So I don't see why we, you know, uh, how we could toss that away as a strong possibility or something that would be too far in the future. Yeah, great question. So I, I agree with that question in a way. I mean, in the book, I take a middle of the road position. Uh, so my sort of foes, if you will, are the techno optimists who say that consciousness is an inevitable byproduct of sophisticated computation. And people like John Searle, these people who are often called biological naturalists who firmly claim consciousness can only be instantiated in biological systems. Okay, so Amazing. now let me, yeah, okay. So let me explain my position a little bit more though, because I, I come off as skeptical, but okay, here's the thing. I think it's easier to get general intelligence without worrying about the real nuances of biological consciousness. And I don't think systems like GPT-3 um, or even necessarily an incipient, an early global brain would have that felt quality of experience, even though they might have caricatures of certain systems that we have. So the systems might have say a primitive prefrontal cortex, but having that alone, something that functions like it. No, but that's not the idea. The idea okay. is people like me in machine learning are investigating consciousness because it provides uh, an advantage from the point of view of uh, flexible generalization to new environments. This is actually one thing on which humans are much better than other species. And it may not be a black and white thing, but there, you know, there are good reasons to think that have been argued, including in some of my papers, that um, this is something that allows us and potentially machines to, um, to respond on the fly to, to new things, uh, what, what people in AI call out of distribution generalization. Uh, and it would be something people design, not just because they want to imitate something in human brains. They would design it because we want machines to have that sort of uh, cognitive ability that comes with it. The, yeah. the advantage in terms of how they can take better decisions, basically, and yeah. better understand the world. I totally agree with that. Um, I think it's a great research project. Um, I was on a similar one um, with the Stanford Research Institute all summer a few years ago, funded by um, a certain defense organization. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> I mean, um, it's a great idea and it will enhance causal reasoning like you hope. And I'm very optimistic. Um, I think though, and yes, I think consciousness has an adaptive value in humans. I think that understanding the neural basis of consciousness will help build AI better. And it will also um, be related to evolution, okay? All that being said, I just think it will be easier. Here, here's a way to put it. Okay, here, here's an example. Okay, suppose you're a music fan of really great jazz and you download some really bad version, like an MP3 that misses all the hues and nuances of the sound. That wouldn't be good enough. You would probably want vinyl or some really sophisticated download to really capture all the hues, you know, the richness of the music. You might be able to satisfy the goals of causal reasoning with a cheap download. 
if that makes sense, as opposed to going as far as building a system that really has phenomenal consciousness in the, in the philosopher's sense. And so in a way, what I'm saying is the real felt quality of experience may not even need to be the holy grail. You may not even need to build it. Sure. It may be enough to build the correlated structures. In particular, I'm a fan of that global workspace theory. I think you are too, right? I, I think that yes. was out in the meetings. Right. I, 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 in fact, I've been meaning to, to read those papers because yes, I think that's, a way to find a system with better causal reasoning to look at the correlated structures. Of course, the neural basis of consciousness is a mystery right now. I mean, I'm not so sure that the brain. Well, I mean, the, the subjective experience might be uh, a kind of illusion or a side effect, uh, as Grigiano is is putting it, of something that has functional value, maybe you know, due to social interactions, and I think also the, the kinds of things uh, I'm thinking about in terms of causality and, and generalization. So uh, it might come, whether we want it or not, uh, as soon as we try to put in those functionalities in machines, that's also possible. Yes, it is possible. That's why I take a middle of the road approach. But let me also mention one more thing that might be relevant here. We're assuming that an AI needs, would be like us, you know, that it would be relevantly neuromorphic. And of course, that's one way to design AIs. But in reality, the AI may not want slow deliberative processing. I mean, consciousness in human is, as you know, connected with working memory and attention, both of which are limited capacity sequential processes. Um, if I was a super intelligence, I would get rid of those. Well, actually, not necessarily. So in my theory, the bottleneck is, is useful as a critical component to get consciousness. Why, why, do, why do we need a bottleneck? Why is it critical? Uh, because it, it allows to uh, reduce the search space to, to, uh, from a machine learning perspective to introduce uh, what's called an inductive bias. Uh, gives a preference to a form of knowledge representation that where knowledge is represented in a very sparse way. Yeah. And that makes it easier to do things like uh, dynamically reflecting on, on new circumstances, composing old pieces of knowledge, um, because each piece of knowledge is simple in a sense and involves only very few things, just like a sentence in English. Yeah, no, I am. I, um... I, it doesn't mean there, there wouldn't be uh, better systems, okay? So evolution has found some form of intelligence. At some point, you know, we'll figure out what makes us intelligent, including consciousness. And, and we could also, once we understand that, probably we'll come up with even better forms of intelligence. Yeah, so I, I pretty much agree with the route that you're, I mean, if I was, you know, if somebody gave me loads of money to build a, a conscious machine, I would take that route. And, you know, I talk about a similar view um, even in my old language of thought, because Bernie Bars co-authored a piece with Murray Shanahan. I think I mentioned it at your meeting. Um, and it was actually on how to get a system that can deal with AI's frame problem. And mm -hmm. so Murray, I think, has been thinking along these lines as well. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. And so I basically agree, although I'm not convinced it would be phenomenally conscious, but again, from the vantage point, yeah, who cares, right? I mean, you just want to deal with the causal reasoning disaster. And I think it can be dealt with. Thanks for your answers. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks a lot. This was a very great exchange. I did go on for a while because there are no, I don't see any question in the queue. Maybe um, Jonathan and Karina, I don't know if there are still a few things you wanted to raise or... Uh, to to uh, to discuss with uh, Suzanne, and then if there are still no question, we can simply end the meeting uh, after that. We have we have fifteen minutes left in any case. So Jonathan, Karina, feel free to step in if uh, Jonathan yes. Uh, sure. Uh, let me see. Uh, so first, Susan, I just wanted to um, go back to the the initial question I had um, about nodes. Let me just put a very direct question: Is it a verbal issue or not? Because it seems like the question being, am I a node? Am I really a node? Or am I just something external to the system that interacts with the system a lot? Um, and I'm, 
I can see that it seems to me like that's a verbal question. The important question is how exactly am I interacting with the system? That's where, that's what's important. And maybe if at some level it turns out, you know, we can have a sort of very like analytic philosophy style question. Yeah. What counts as being a node? Like what counts as being a table? Oh, is it a table if it only has three legs but you can still eat dinner on it? Maybe, you know. So there's that kind of argument about being a node. But then there are like, I think the more important questions about, um, you know, like what goes along with that? What happens because it's a node? And there I'm wondering if we can just sort of take a detour around the question of whether it strictly counts as a node and just focus on, you know, the substantive upshot that you think there will be there. Well, I mean, I like the care careful crafting of what a node is for reasons involving the metaphysics of mind, because I've been personally interested in what it is to be minded and the nature of substance. And, you know, I was thinking, of course, in terms of part whole relationships, and I found it to be fascinating intellectually um, that um, a brain, excuse me, a global brain could be metaphysically constituted by entities which are themselves conscious, but itself quite possibly not conscious. Um, for example, I'll give you an example. I mean, there are all sorts of interesting implications here. I mean, Tononi has an exclusion axiom, which I think this is a counterexample to. So I, as usual, I totally disagree with Tononi. <laughs> I think he cooked up his axioms. I talked to him about this. He read a Jaguan Kim paper and has, which by the way, for people here, this is a controversial philosophical paper uh, that, not very many people even agree with today and probably is outmoded by issues in quantum gravity. And it turns out it's the basis of a lot of Tononi's claims about phi needing to be measured at the level of the very rock bottom machine level. Um, but anyway, so I think there are lots of little things or maybe big things that come up about the constitution of minds, what minds are, um, and also the extended mind issue, which are interesting. And then, you know, I just think it's an interesting way of framing the issue because from, from an ethical standpoint, I didn't get to raise this, I forgot, but I mean, you might wanna know who owns your thought data. Um, and if I'm right that some of these super intelligences will either not even be known to you, I mean, do you, would you like it if, your innermost thoughts became part of some Uber algorithm fueled by the Chinese government. Um, you know, I mean, I would want to know who owned my data and what it was doing. And I would also want to know um, who's influencing my thoughts. Does that help? Sorry if I'm ranting. Oh. I have really bad oh, allergies. Yeah. I'm out on a farm. I have a, <laughs> I can't even breathe. Okay, well, do you, we can, we can stop here if, if, if you need to, to stop. Otherwise we have no, to, <laughs> all right. Okay. Just to be sure, but it's, it's, all, it's, uh, we just have a few minutes left. So Karina, Karina, I have a question and Yeshua also wanted to ask a, a question. So uh, can you go ahead, Karina, and then, uh, and then Yeshua. Sure. Yeah. I just wanted to follow up on, um, first on the question that Jonathan had asked. I think my question was a similar one of not so much the focus on the node of, so when when do we constitute a node or and not, um, but more about the global brain. So when is there a global brain and, and when is there not? When does it kind of come into effect? Uh, and when does it, when is it not? Or what are the conditions there? Maybe that's too much of an analytic philosophy question, but I guess the reason I'm worried about it is that like Jonathan was asking with respect to the node is that what matters then about calling it a brain as opposed to just calling it a system, which we're clearly are connected in some kind of system already. And um, so, so what is this? It seems either kind of like a scale or a slippery slope, or, or is there a reason to think there's a qualitative difference there? And then I just also wanted to follow up on the interesting question that um, Yashua had asked, um, which I, I take it that there's some potential there to solve something like a frame problem if you have like a, a linear way of focusing on your attention, which which is interesting, yeah. obviously, and, and yeah. worthy of pursuit. Um, and then I, I guess maybe this isn't a well-formed question, <laughs> um, but or maybe it's a kind of response on, on 
like me sort of putting on Susan's hat and saying, maybe this is a way Susan could respond. I'm not sure. But um, I'm thinking about really exotic forms that already exist that Murray and Peter Godfrey Smith have um, explored like octopuses. And I think um, oh, yeah. that that's something really similar to what you're describing um, and whether or not, you know, the idea that we don't have necessarily one sort of linear stream of consciousness, but maybe a system where multiple streams of consciousness emerge yeah, is a better I, I, analogy I, for you. Yeah. Um, okay, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, sorry. I'm, I'm an octopus enthusiast. Okay. And um, yeah, that was just sort of a suggestion. And then I'll let you respond yeah. to the first question I asked. Well, oh, okay. So um, let's see. Let me respond to the second one first, that, that point before I forget. Um, so yeah, I'm really interested in the possibility of highly distributed systems and whether the smartest systems would need to instantiate a global workspace to go back to, um, you know, Yashua's point. Um, I hope I pronounced your name right. <laughs> Did I? Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I'm writing a book on this. So obviously these are the kinds of issues I'm going to explore. Um, I'm extraordinarily fascinated by the octopus because as you know, it can initiate motor commands without consulting the central executive, right? Um, and I wanna think hard about whether, what the space of intelligences would look like. And I know that's hard given our epistemic situation as humble intellectual beings ourselves, right? But um, I, do, I do suspect that um, distributed systems could work very well too. And, you know, it's probably about context. So, you know, to go back to the octopus example, I mean, why did the octopus evolve that way? I mean, did I don't know if you guys saw the film, My Octopus Teacher. Oh, my favorite film of the year. <laughs> you all have to watch it if you haven't seen it. But I mean, look at the situation with Chromotophores, I know I mispronounced that. I mean, you know, cuttlefish and, you know, these animals that are capable of changing, um, you know, color and shape very rapidly given their environment. I mean, it's probably the case that from a neural processing standpoint, they just can't afford a central controller. They need to act very quickly at the level of limbs. So think of evolutionary environments um, like that. And now think about how distributed an internet or global brain would be. I mean, if it's so distributed, would it really have time to send signals back to consult the central processing unit, the singular working memory and attention? Um, I'm not so sure. That's why I think distributed systems might be of great interest here in trying to think about the global brain. But as Bernie Bars himself always said, um, there really, he was never intending to assume that there would be only a single global workspace in a system. It could be that a system has multiple. Okay, well, that's answering your first question, sort of. Um, you know, but now that to go back to the earlier one, I'm sorry, that was answering your second. Okay. All right. So notice that generality, like general intelligence, that demarcation, I think that's a matter of degree. So, I mean, in a way, a GPT-3 is already a general intelligence. I mean, it's able to cross different domains and exhibit an early kind of flexibility. So for me, I, I don't see a kind of, I think that these categories will have a graded structure. And so what we want to be able to do is we want to find markers for hyper-intelligent systems, right? And so if you are a believer in phi, for example, you might try to, this has been done, uh, see if you could measure phi on certain pockets of the internet to see if, you know, some sort of primitive superintelligence was emerging, for example. Okay. Now, obviously, I, I mean, it, I suppose, you know, I don't mean to make global statements about information integration because there are different approaches. I know Anil Seth has a more simplified measure, you know, whereas like Tononi's is uh, intractable in many set settings. Um, but anyway, you know, you might look for mathematical uh, markers in, you might look to network theory, for example. Um, anyway, I, but, uh, you know, I do think that the, it's important that we 
actually look for markers of intelligent systems uh, in light of the global brain hypothesis? I don't know if that fully answered your question. Well, I, I, agree, I agree that we should look for markers of intelligent systems. And I agree that we're going to have to look, or I think we'll have to look for different markers as systems become more distributed because the sign, you know, for example, the ACT test might not be a good test for a highly distributed system. So we may need to develop different types of tests or different types of markers for um, different types of systems. Um, yeah, but I, I think I'm still, I think I still struggle with the, the question of what do we gain from calling it a global brain? And um, oh, I, I think see. for me, it's it's almost like a kind of fear mongering. It's a scary thing to think about. But on the other hand, we're already kind of a part of a system like this and it's not too scary. So do we gain something from calling it that? I'm not totally sure. It, may, may I just step in and ask for if, if it's possible, a yes or no answer? Like, do you consider that we're already part of a global brain? as you de describe it according to premises one to three in your argument or, or not? And if not, what do we need? Like what's the, the closest thing that can happen that will make us part of it? No, I don't think that we are yet part. Um, I think we're moving in that direction. And again, it goes back to the not, we don't have a, a widespread use of brain detection wearables. We don't have brain chips. Um, are we moving in that direction? I would say yes. And again, my categories, I, as I said, are graded. So it's not that there's a firm yes or no. Um, generality, for example, is a matter of degree. So maybe being a global brain system is also a matter of degree. Now, why does it matter? Um, well, I think it's super important for AI safety. Um, you know, if we have a sense that the most intelligent system out there may actually emerge or be part of um, an internet system where we are actually feeding data to it, that tells us something about the shape of superintelligence and it gives us a handle on superintelligence control. And it also makes an imperative that we look for markers. Now that said, um, if you have something like the US DOD that's doing this, you're not going to see evidence necessarily of it. Um, but in terms of um, the search for intelligence here, I think it might be useful. I, I speak now, you know, in the context of my work as the NASA chair, that, you know, there are all kinds of conversations at NASA and with astrobiologists in general about how you look for intelligent life when it's vastly different than our species. Um, and so we might search for techno signatures of sort. Um, we might look for anomalies. That's, that's what NASA likes to say in the search for intelligent aliens. The slogan is look for anomalies in the system. So you might look at information flow across the internet and look for very strange anomalies. I mean, I, I imagine cybersecurity experts in various countries are doing this already. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, Yeshua asked if he could ask another question. So, I would, uh, I would, I would really like uh, it if you could have the time to do so. So, do you want to? Do you want to go ahead, uh, Yeshua? Sure. <clears throat> My question goes back to the AI safety and maybe the political question that you you slightly raised in your presentation. So, there are all these really scary things that could happen, and as you said, um, there a reasonable, plausible consequence of the uh, market forces and uh, sort of kind of law of the jungle-ness of our world. Um, don't we have to see to that and, and, and uh, try to escape that uh, determinism uh, by global coordination between humans in a way that we're not yet doing? Yes. Um Absolutely. <laughs> Any help you want to give, I'm all ears. Um, you know, I work with the head of the AI caucus in Congress, um, Jerry McNerney, and then the, the senators, some of them, um, you know, I present to them some days in front of, uh, you know, over breakfast. Um, I, I, they're ineffectual, though. I mean, how do you really get stuff to happen? I mean, it's just, it's frustrating, right? Oh. 
in democracies, in democracies, I think the general public has to understand that the current economic and political system we are in is eventually leading, leading us into you know, one catastrophe or another, whether it's climate change, uh, antimicrobial resistance or uh, AI control, and that uh, uh, we can't just go on with uh, just simple local evolutionary pressure to determine our future. Yeah, yeah. I'm, that's kind of why I moved over to Florida, um, not for global warming, <laughs> um, but, but uh, because I founded an institute um, on these kind of issues and I'm hoping to um, do some work to raise public awareness. Good. Yeah, it is awful, isn't it? And, you know, thanks to everyone for bearing with me on this topic today because, you know, here we are in a global pandemic and I'm telling you there's going to be a global brain that sells your thought data. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Suzanne. It was really, really great to have you. I think that was really a great talk to finish the, the year. So I think you, we all deserve a round of uh, physical or virtual uploads. Mm -hmm. And and so this will be our last talk for the this year, but please stay tuned. So recordings are online for some of the talks we've had this year. Um, and we will uh, we will uh, post more information for the talks for for next year. So thank you uh, everyone once again for being uh, with us, and thank you Suzanne, Karina, and uh, Jonathan.